Thank you very much for the opportunity. My name is Catalina Segura and I am a hydrologist with the AJ Andrews. I prepared this presentation along with our PI, Michael Nelson. Uh, so we are one of the original LTR sites, continuously funded since 1980. And in early March, like many of you, we have submitted our eighth proposal. We represent a biome, a forest biome, and specifically a site that consists of large quantities of iconic Pacific Northwest old growth forest. The image on the left gives you a sense of our location near uh, the city of Eugene. We are also a mountainous site with cold, fast streams and huge humongous trees and iconic species such like the spotted uh, owl. Uh, our conceptual models have evolved through time since the 1990s and had fairly had had a fairly classic driver response theme with a theme here in the center of each diagram. And in um, this uh, new cycle, cycle eight, uh, we're focused in the future of the forest. Since 1970, relatively little, little change has occurred despite climate warming. Uh, and this has raised some interesting hypotheses about how 50 year old, 500 year old trees that are 80 meters tall will respond to these changes. And as the changes begin to occur, how will they take place? So in LTR8, we propose to examine interactions involving forest structure, disturbance legacies, and species as well as science and values. The, LT, the Andrews Forest has a strongly seasonal climate with uh, wet winters and dry summers. And so our summer stream flow depends on stored winter rain and snow. The Andrews is located over a wide range of elevations, as you can see here in this map, and that uh, then results in having precipitation that comes both as rain and snow. However, the snowpack has been declining in the Western US, and that has uh, then raised some questions about well, how decreasing snowpack stream uh, affects stream ecology, water quality, and water supply. And that's, that has driven questions in different areas. So how has the snowpack changed? This figure here shows a decreasing trend in snow water, water equivalent and the, the anomaly of the stream water equivalent. And you can see a declining trend. To, to illustrate that in 2015, we exper experienced a large drought and that's the red line here in this other diagram. And you can see how this um, snowpack in 2015 was significantly lower than the year before and significantly lower than the normal and one of the lowest recorded since 1930. At the same time, temperature has also been increasing. This is July temperature, daily uh, maximum, and you can see also an increasing trend. So the question is how these changes will affect interception of water by the forest canopy, movement of water through the critical zone and stream biogeochemistry, and the extent of the stream network with available habitat for organisms. So I'm gonna talk about each of those three a little bit. So if you think about old growth forest, the old growth forest canopy is complex and includes abundant epiphytes and little endophytes. And these influence water interception, which is eventually lost as evaporation. Uh, it also affects water storage and the amount of timing and timing of water that reaches the ground. On co in contrast, the uh, canopy of second growth is simpler and has less ability to store water. And so in addition, the second growth forest evapotranspire more water than the old growth. So the interaction of precipitation and canopy is not entirely understood and uh, we don't know what is the role of these epiphytes or these endophytes in drought conditions. In addition, we don't know how the canopy precipitation interaction is going to change. We dimension uh, changes in precipitation form from snow to rain. If we move down the canopy into our the critical zone and our rivers, uh, synoptic sampling of water stable isotopes during the drought uh, of 2015 also highlighted contrasting water sources throughout our landscape. So this map shows concentrations of uh, oxygen 18 in September 2015. And you can note, for example, that a small ground fed stream in the east side, the, the one that appears blue right here, provided a disproportional amount of water. And what we believe is that it collected water that fell up in the ridge uh, as snow through funnel and finally through porous lava into this spring. And it's evident how much influence this spring has by looking at how blue everything else is below from it. Other parts of the network here 
uh, in this in the north. The, these markers that appear red are more dependent on water store in deep earth flows. The thing is that we don't know what are the implications of these different flow paths in uh, chemical in biogeochemistry or why is the relative importance of springs like this one during other parts of the year. And um, finally, I also want to um, share with you these other results um, that have highlighted um, how the stream network has been contracting over time. So um, researchers evaluated historic records from that are 30, 38 to 69 years long and are in our gauge watersheds and found that 41% 40, of the network is contracting well, 59% of the network is not changing. And it's important to know that there's no streams here that appear blue. So nothing has been increasing in frequency of surface flow. And when they simulated uh, over the past 65 years, they found that overall 24%, uh, a 24% decline in flowing water and a 9% decline in network length. So kind of related to this in some ways, another study looked at the effect of the drought in, of 2015 on trout biomass and found significant changes in most tributaries. So you can see here, trout biomass in, the, in 2015 are the red bars, are lower than trout biomass in 2014, which are the blue bars. And with that, uh, I'll take questions after, and thank you very much. Great, thank you, Catalina.